Hi, everybody. Welcome to my channel. Um, I'm Mr. Mac. You're probably watching this big video as kind of the beginning of your A-Push journey, and it's going to be a, a long year, and there's a lot of information to gain or to review depending on your background and your history. Um, but this is the first content we will cover in this course. We will begin it um, today. And it's really important to keep in mind that although this is a very large task, it takes um, a, a daily intake, right? It takes a, a daily struggle to, to really overcome this hurdle, but it can be done. Many people have gone before you and done it. Um, I am here to help you the entirety of the way, um, but this is just the beginning of something much, much larger. So without further ado, we will begin our long journey with our very first step today. Before we get into any content, I wanna explain what AP US History really is. It's a college level course in a high school setting, and it covers what is um, the scope of American history. Now, that is an interesting question in and of itself of what is American history? How far back do we go? And how present do we go? And where's that blurred line between um, current events and history? But what we're going to do today is we are going to look at what we are going to call period one. The course is broken up into nine periods or nine units at times. Um, I typically lump periods one and two together because period one is so small. Um, but we are going to be looking today at some early contacts amongst groups in North America. That means contacts amongst different Native American groups and then Europeans with the other Europeans and Europeans with natives in the new world, and the conflict and the impact that's gonna have. We're gonna be looking at what these years mean. The course begins in 1491. 1491 is not typically a year that most of you would know, but it is a symbolic year. It's one year before 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So it's a year before Columbus actually gets here up until the first permanent English settlement, because this is a US history class, we're gonna follow our political lineage through the English colonies, um, in 1607 with the settlement of Jamestown in Virginia. And we'll pick up our story there in a later video, but we're gonna combine periods one and two, and we're gonna lump these together, um, because periods one and two, along with period nine at the very, very end of the course, is the smallest amount that's actually on the exam. The big essay that most students usually have PTSD from um, is called the DBQ, the document-based question. And the information from periods one, two, and nine will not be the exclusive topic of the DBQ. Now, it can appear in other sections, such as it will appear in the multiple choice section, what's called the short answer question, which we'll talk about later. Um, and the LEQ, the long essay question, which is like a traditional essay prompt where you're just given a prompt and you write about it, um, that that could possibly um, have content from these areas, but it's a much smaller portion. So we don't use it as deeply as we do perhaps periods three through eight. But that begs the question, what purpose does period one and two and then eventually period nine serve? It is sort of the book ends. Um, periods one and two are the context for the real core, what most everyone agrees as the, the real political beginnings of American history, although the information periods one and two are, are very, very important. Um, it is the context for the political beginnings of America. It is the context in which the revolution happens. What are the things that are happening prior to this that lead to these events happening? So this is really um, the beginning of our information to set up this large stage. There's a variety of different objectives that we're gonna to touch upon today, including the context in which the age of exploration really begins and when these encounters actually happen in the Americas, um, how and why different native um, populations um, existed um, the way that they did before European contact, as well as the effects of that European contact in the new world. We'll also look at something called the Columbian Exchange, extremely important. It's gonna be one of those proper nouns, one of those specific things that you're really, really gonna to wanna to know. Um, and we're gonna look up um, where this change really happens beginning in 1492. 
We'll also look at the growth of the Spanish Empire, one of the first and largest landmass empires in the New World, um, and also kind of how and why different Europeans and Native Americans um, develop different perspectives of each other and how those really change over this time period. And very lastly, kind of how this um, general transatlantic voyage, so the journeying across the Atlantic Ocean, how um, this is going to impact our story. And that's what we're always looking for. Why is this relevant to our story? What are the big picture themes here? This course is not about regurgitating facts. This course is about connecting the dots, right? Bringing these things together. So we really begin our course where many of you, if you took a Western Civ course or um, uh, some sort of European history course like that or world history course, you likely ended somewhere around or at least covered the Renaissance. Um, and the Renaissance was this rebirth and this resurgence of culture in Europe. Um, and with this, it created a large desire for new trade routes to Asia. Um, and this led to what's known as the Age of Exploration. Now, these trade routes to Asia um, originally were by land, but we try to find faster, more productive ways, more lucrative ways to get these goods back and forth. And so um, for, a, for a large period of um, history, the belief was that the world was flat, that you couldn't go um, off um, to the west of, of Europe, and eventually you'd get to the edge of the world um, and, and you'd fall off and you'd never be seen from again. But some um, explorers with the advent of brand new technology began to challenge this idea and push those borders to try to find a brand new route to Asia. It was really first led by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Um, they found different trade routes. Um, they founded different colonies. Um, and they also found new people to Christianize. We are going to see this colonization um, in the New World. It's going to have a variety of different effects, um, one of them being the destruction of native culture. Number two, we're going to see the setting up of permanent white settlements. And we are also going to see an extreme amount of wealth for European nations. Um, there are some other more subtle nuanced effects that we will also see. But if we're talking about big picture claims, these three are really what we're going to see. It's not so much important as to know what happened, but also why this happened. So understand, why did these people decide to go and look for a different route? Why were they able to do it? Because there's one thing between wanting to do it and actually being able to do it. Um, and the motivations um, come along with brand new technology. Um, and it allows them to actually reach the new world and reach it consistently, which allows for the setting up of trade, trade routes and settlements more permanently. The best way to sum up these motivations, and this is something that you can almost carry through the entirety of the course, is think about why are people moving? Why are people going somewhere else? What is their motivation? In this case, for this time period, we're gonna use what's known as the three Gs, gold, glory, and God, right? It doesn't really matter what order you go in, but these are the three Gs. Number one, gold, right? There's this desire for wealth. There are new markets for trade. Um, this desire to escape poverty um, that many are feeling in Europe as places become more and more crowded, right? So that gold can mean a variety of things, desire for greater personal wealth, desire for different trade routes for a country, or desire for individuals to escape poverty. They may not become rich, but they won't be as poor as they are. They're looking for a better life. Glory, there are a, a massive um, prevalence of uh, monarchs, kings, that are desiring to create these massive overseas empires. Um, there are also this desire for individual explorers to try to make themselves famous, um, to make this huge name for themselves. So there's a personal gain imperative, glory, and God. There is this desire by European Christians and Catholics to convert people to their faith, um, that this is their motivation, even their justification for the way that they behave. And this is all coming off of this desire for new knowledge in the Renaissance, and it sort of builds up to this massive exploration and this race to the new world. It becomes an imperialistic competition between all of these nations. But it's not so much 
enough to just want something. You need to have the means to do it. There are better ships that allow um, the Europeans to traverse the open oceans, the caravels. They have better navigational tools. So when they're out in the middle of the ocean, they know which direction they're going properly and that they can return to those same locations or even make it back home. They have something called the astrolabe and the sextant, um, which are ways of, of kind of measuring longitude and latitude, um, sort of like a, a more primitive GPS of trying to find the location of where am I in the world. Using a compass, figuring out which direction you are heading, um, and also having maps with longitude and latitude to pair with things like the astrolabe and the sextant using the position of the stars um, to plot their individual locations, more consistent map making, um, allowing for, again, more consistent travel of not just themselves, but others to continue to come. And the Europeans um, are going to first begin some of their different voyages and their forms of exploration more on their continent, finding new ways to Asia, better trade routes, for example, to China along the old Silk Road. They're eventually going to expand their horizons further and further outside of just their continent. We are going to have people explore into the new world that people do not know exists until they first arrive there. And that's not to say that they found it and poof, it popped up on the map, but they found it for the Europeans who didn't know it existed. Um, we have people settling in what becomes modern day Canada, um, the, the modern day Caribbean and, and modern day South America. Um, but think about even the names that we refer to the indigenous people in North America, Indians. That name is given by Christopher Columbus, who believes that he has found a new faster, more direct route to India, instead of going all the way around Africa, that he thinks he's found this new lucrative market um, that can be exploited, this quicker route to increase profits. And that is where the name come from, or the referral to the Caribbean as the West Indies. This um, misnomer, this improper naming is an example of a little bit of the ignorance of the Europeans of not exactly knowing correctly where they were and the discovery of new lands. And eventually, over time, with the building up of these trade networks, it's going to continue as more and more explorers flood over to the new world. There are major different explorers that you can look at. Um, for example, Vasco da Gama finds India after he sails around Africa. You have Christopher Columbus discovering America uh, when he was looking for a westward route to India after da Gama, and it becomes probably one of the most important um, uh, trade routes. Now, we're not saying that he is a positive individual, and we know, especially from more modern discussions and debates, um, when we actually look at what Columbus did, it was much, much more graphic than maybe the, the stories you hear in elementary school, but there is no arguing whatsoever that he was not the most probably significant explorer ever. We have people like Ferdinand Magellan, who was the first to circumnavigate, completely sail all the way around the globe. Different explorers um, finding different regions, including Samuel Champagne founding Quebec, um, again, looking for a different passage to India. So all of these men were looking for different ways to trade with Asia. Now they found, they stumbled upon land that was already populated, um, that they absolutely had no idea existed, but it's going to lead this massive flood, um, almost like a, an exodus of sorts, over to the new world in search of money, in search of profits, in search of personal gain, in search of expanding their faiths and, uh, and Christianizing other people. But it's not just going to be the Portuguese and the Spanish. They will be the first, but it's going to see kind of this flood of effects of many other European nations coming over to the New World, like the French, like the British, like the Dutch. And this is going to be the bulk of our focus as we go into this early exploration. But... This does not just affect the European nations. There are impacts on every single region involved in this trade work, trade network. The Europeans, those living in the Americas, as they become to be known, 
and those living in Africa as part of this larger trade network to increase profits. But it's increasingly ignorant to ignore the distinct, unique, diverse, expansive cultures that existed in North America prior to this exploration. However, it's important to understand that you may have heard the phrase, history is written by the victors, history is written by the conquerors, right? That the Europeans are the one that conquered North America over the indigenous people that had already lived there. And so because of that, most history books are written from the perspective of the white Europeans that um, sort of display or depict um, these uh, indigenous people as so very primitive and behind and uncivilized and like savages, but it's very, very far from the case. What's going to happen through this context is because of their differences, there's going to be a variety of misunderstandings, there's going to be a variety of conflicts, and it's going to lead to the ultimate decimation of the Native American population in the New World. When we talk about Native Americans in the New World, there are so many different tribes and unique cultures to talk about. And so you can't just say, oh, all Native Americans or all indigenous people, all Natives are like this. Um, they are so unique to their terrain, to their culture, their spiritual beliefs. Um, it's the same thing as we say, oh, all Europeans are the same. Their languages might be different. There might be different dialects, different cultural values, um, different artistic styles, different everything. Um, but there are certain things that we can try to pull together to understand these different groups, some general claims that we can make without going to every single tribe. And so in AP US history, they allow for these general themes to be made so that you can use examples from your region, right, from wherever you are or wherever you wish to understand and seek that knowledge to back and support your claims. These different native groups adapted to their different identities um, because of their geographic location. So if, for example, if you live on the coast, for example, um, we are here in Rhode Island. So in Rhode Island, the Narragansett Indian tribe is right on the water. And if you're right on the water, you're probably gonna use that natural resource, heavy, heavy use of fishing um, for that tribe, absolutely. However, if you live um, way out west um, and you are living in um, what is the modern day southwest of the United States, such as Arizona or New Mexico, Southern California, Utah, Nevada, you're not going to have the ocean really to use at your disposal unless you're sitting on the coast. So as much as you may want to be a fisher, um, you can't do that if you're in the middle of the desert. If you are living up in the recesses of modern day northern Canada, um, someone like the Eskimos or the Inuits, no, you are not going to be growing tropical fruits like bananas. Um, it, it's just not going to happen because your geography does not allow for it. So different groups adapted to their different environments in very unique ways. Um, maybe they were more agricultural, they were more hunters, they were hunter and gathering, sort of a combination, or they were fishing tribes. And before Columbus so-called discovered America, um, or really stumbles upon America in 1492, um, indigenous people all across this continent um, had their own unique ways of life. They had systems of government, they had systems of religion, they had unique gender roles. Um, all of these things were very, very different than the Europeans and it creates many different misunderstandings and beliefs that um, the Europeans were superior um, to these natives because they didn't have necessarily the exact same technology, but they had different technology, they had different studies, they had different beliefs. But that misunderstanding on both parts, when you read any sources recovered from um, uh, Native American cultures and European cultures of this just general misunderstanding and confusion amongst both groups. For example, when you look at the Aztecs in Central America or the Incans in South America, um, they had these massive, colossal empires, huge cities, bigger than in some cases anything that would have seen in Europe. Um, but, but they were viewed as savages and uncivilized by the Europeans. They were not viewed on the same level and they used this, um, 
believed difference, this belief superiority to justify their treatment and subjugation of the native indigenous people. We have cities like Tenochtitlan, uh, modern day Mexico City um, by the Aztecs. We see farming, we see agriculture, we see irrigation, very complex societies and civilizations. But there were different practices that were not accepted by the Europeans, such as human sacrifice um, of the Aztecs. Um, and this was one of the many sources and contentions of confusion. Or we see Machu Picchu um, of the Incan Empire. Um, and again, very complex building structures, people to build cities in the sides of the mountains, but they adapted to their terrain. We have other cultures like this outside of just the Aztecs and the Incans, but also like the Mayans, for example, or another famous um, Native American civilization are able to support these massive populations because of stable crops like maize that made it possible for the growth of all of these native groups of these large civilizations. You may want to have a large amount of people, but if you can't feed them, they will not survive. One of the most basic tenets of building a civilization, if you do not have a food source, populations cannot grow. And so the uh, growth of maize, or as we call corn in English, um, allows for the growth of these populations. And you see it even merged into um, the indigenous um, populations and then into um, what we would just consider traditional Latin American, even cuisine. Um, for example, like tortillas or tamales in Central America, right? The use of maize, the use of masa, the use of this um, one crop as just kind of a staple and norm in those societies. But this giant empire, right? All of these giant empires in Central and South America um, are going to be destroyed by the arrival of the conquistadors or the conquerors of the Spanish empire that create this massive um, control over the new world across South, Central, and even into North America. In the middle of what is the modern day United States, we have the Plain Indians. They were hunters, they were gatherers. They were what we would call nomadic, which means mobile. They didn't have sort of a set up home. Um, probably one of the most famous um, native tribes that we will talk about much later into this course after the Civil War is the Sioux tribe. Um, they were mobile hunters and there are uh, stories and we can look at examples of the impact of European contact on groups in a positive way. Um, the Spanish sometimes were defeated and, and, and left their horses to run wild and became the wild horse populations of the Mountain West. And the Sioux tribe um, took that into their hunting culture and able to use it to better become sophisticated hunters. Um, stories of some of the best, most sophisticated warrior tribes in North America. We see different native groups on the East Coast, such as the Powhatan Indians, right? Maybe you know the story of Pocahontas or believe Disney story of Pocahontas um, on the East Coast near Jamestown or the Iroquois or Algonquin Indians in the Northeast. They were smaller farming communities. And these are the groups that have the first contact with British uh, settlers in Virginia and Massachusetts. And these groups are the ones we're going to focus on the most because of the immense contact with the English settlers. Um, these Native Americans on the Atlantic coast of North America were in much more smaller communities um, as compared to, say, like the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incans, um, much more mobile bands of tribes. Um, farming and hunting and gathering was used, so it was diverse forms of agriculture to be able to survive. The Eastern woodland Indians um, were really the first um, natives to actually come in contact with the English settlers. And the reason why that's so important is this is going to be a core part of our course because we are studying English history leading into American history. There are so many different Native American tribes all across what we today call the United States of America. 
these different tribes reacted um, to their environment in different ways. And because of their diverse geographic um, conditions, like the climate, the soil, um, it allows for them to develop very unique cultures. You're going to use what you have at your disposal. Some Native American tribes are going to form up and down the Mississippi River. Others are going to settle in the southwest, in the desert. Some are going to settle near the mountain ranges. Some are going to settle in the forest. Some are going to settle in the Arctic tundra um, of what we would today call the northern parts of Canada. And all of these Native tribes had their own unique cultures. And that's so important to understand because the Europeans trying to essentially lump them all together to try to understand all of them. Um, it becomes very difficult of interacting with these different groups when there are different social values, political values, um, and, and these gaps are really going to be the forming of very shallow, fragile relationships. It's going to lead to various forms of conflict all throughout American history, not just in the 1600s or 1700s, all throughout the 1800s, and even you can say continuing to the 1900s and today. But we are going to focus primarily in our earlier stories with what's happening with the Eastern Woodland Indians because those are the native tribes that will have the earliest contact with European explorers. There are many different European countries that come and explore the New World, and this becomes known as the Age of Exploration. Uh, but when we talk about exploration in terms of the American story, the four most important and significant ones that we will talk about are the Spanish, the French, the English, and the Dutch. Um, we are going to leave out um, one of the earliest and arguably one of the first trailblazers with the Portuguese, although they are important in world history. For the American story, they're not as immediately relevant. So we're going to be focusing on these four in particular. And we're actually going to lump together and make some comparison between the French and the Dutch. So all of these different European nations will take different routes, um, different means of exploration, um, and they're going to come over to the New World for different reasons. And because of the reasons that they come over is going to affect the way that these colonies that are set up are going to be run, why there's going to be certain forms of government, why certain people come over, how they're run, how they interact with the different native populations. They're all going to settle in very different portions of North America. Um, what we are going to be focusing on primarily are the Spanish. The Spanish are going to be the largest landmass wise. We will see the French settling in modern day Canada and down the Mississippi River. The Dutch, which are going to settle in modern day New York City and New York State. The English forming the 13 colonies and what is New England, the middle colonies, the southern colonies. Um, and and that is going to be our primary focus for this course. But this comes on the back of the Columbian Exchange. Why is this happening? What is causing this to occur? Why are so many people coming over? And it's very important to understand the causes and effects of the Columbian Exchange, not just on the New World, but on the Old World as well, on Europe, on Africa. The arrival of the Europeans led to what's known as the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is this transatlantic phenomenon where new products, ideas, beliefs, diseases are exchanged between the native populations and the Europeans. Both sides had things that the other side had never seen before. And so they began to trade and interact each other. Right? There were economics effects to this trade. They each had things that each other wanted. But there were also social and demographic impacts to this change. But what I would like to really squash before it ever gets embedded into anyone's brain, and one of the most early common misconceptions that I see students have, is the Columbian Exchange is not a physical exchange done by Columbus. It's an exchange, rather, as an effect of Columbus's journey. Because Columbus comes over to the New World, and because of his information that he brings back to Europe, many people begin flooding over to find similar trading experiences and new goods, new ideas, new diseases begin to be traded back and forth as a result of this massive trade wave. 
we see natives introducing things to whites, which they bring back to Europe. Um, they bring back the old world, such as corn, tobacco, potatoes, peanuts, we had never seen before, even things like tomatoes. The Italians never had red sauce before the Colombian exchange. The Irish never had potatoes before the Colombian exchange. And the Europeans brought over things like horses, which we already talked earlier, like the Sioux tribe um, brought into their culture, a positive effect. Livestock that were brought over, um, different forms of citrus, and also diseases. And these diseases are going to kill what's estimated at least 90 to 95 percent of the indigenous population due to disease alone. It is going to be absolutely monumental um, in the impact on indigenous people. It will completely wipe out cultures through disease because of really the tight, compacted amount of people in the old world. And you think about residual effects of like the plague that eventually people had built up antibodies to. They bring these over. The Europeans already had contact with them. They had already built up resistance to these. The native people had never been experienced to this. And so it completely runs through. One of the most devastating ones was smallpox. Um, this is very similar to think about the way that the COVID-19 virus has expanded all around the population and the effects because the, um, the human um, body had not yet built up antibodies to this disease, to this sickness. And so as a result, it took people very quickly because they had never been experienced to it. But take about this on a much more deadly disease on a much larger severe scale. The Columbian Exchange brings over so many things back and forth, but understand that there are both positive and negative effects for both sides. Um, positive effects, of course, there are exchange of technology like guns and weapons like that that are given to the indigenous people, different crop, but also the diseases that run rampant. But some of these livestock, such as horses, are used um, extremely well by certain tribes. But there are also goods that are brought back to the old world from North America that are going to be used to help stimulate population growth in Europe. So there are positive effects back in Europe. And some of these goods are going to be brought to Africa to use to be trade for slave labor once colonies get set up. So there are effects on North America, there are effects on Europe, and there are effects on Africa. And the Colombian exchange creates this massive um, trade network all around the world. And this is the impact of Columbus. There are many other ones, but when we're looking about kind of this global connection, what happens and why does it happen? Um, also, the call for the kind of increase in prevalence of African slavery will be a result from this, as well as the desire for raw materials in the new world and harvesting and essentially mining that and bringing that back to the old world is going to be called for, that this is some of the impact of Columbus. So we're not saying that Columbus was a nice guy, that he was misunderstood, that he had a bad day, because that's far from the truth. But what we are saying is he is one of the most significant figures in European history and arguably in American history as well. That is essentially the shell of what period one is all about. But what we're going to do is we're going to do an even more condensed review. If you're one of my students coming in for the first time this year, this will be a breakdown of sort of some of the summer homework information that you were expected to look at that is going to cover a lot of these general trends. And then for other viewers or people that are watching this for a review, this is going to be a good overview of the key concepts introduced um, by the AP organization. When you look at the years of the course for AP US history, it goes from 1491 up until present, which is a very, very large amount of information. To be able to figure out what exactly you really need to know, you should be looking at the key concepts, the key objectives that explain what general tenets, what general ideas um, are you expected to be able to understand, use, and or argue to prepare yourself for 
the exam. And the best way to do that is to read them yourselves by going to this link. It will take you to a very, very large PDF, but your information you're gonna need is gonna start on page 28. And that's what all of these general ideas and everything that I do is gonna be based off of. It will be in line with this content. The first thing to really know about period one in a quick review is understanding that different native groups develop different identities um, because of their geographic location. So if you lived on the coast, you'll likely be a fishing tribe. If you lived up um, in kind of an Inuit or an Eskimo tribe up in Northern, what we'd call today Canada, um, you'd likely be a hunter. Um, if you are, living in kind of the eastern woodlands you might be a combination of a hunter gatherer you may be agricultural so depending on the type of terrain that you have depends on the type of culture and the ways that you will interact with that terrain but as the europeans come over it's really going to start to change all of that it's going to change the way that the native americans um, cultures are going to exist this change is gonna be a result of this idea called the Columbian Exchange, this phenomena of trading between the New World and the Old World across the Atlantic Ocean, cultural diffusion, um, trading of goods, trading of technologies, trading of diseases essentially, um, are gonna impact both sides in different ways. There are gonna be positive impacts um, on the European, such as access to different crops like potatoes, maize, what we call corn, and tomatoes, so much more positive impacts that allow for the growth of cultures, right? Civilizations and populations in these tighter urban centers in the old world. But also there are gonna be negative effects in Africa with the trading of these goods um, for African slave labor that's sent to harvest more of these goods. In the Americas, you are going to see European goods brought over and probably one of the um, most positive examples is the use of the horses that are brought over to the Americas. And the horses brought over are definitely going to impact and change um, the new world. It's going to allow for tri tribes like the Sioux tribe to hunt at a greater rate, um, to use um, these animals in a very different way that's going to change and expedite the growth of their culture and the way that they're going to interact with the native animals such as the American bison. But there are other impacts of the change besides the positive ones. Um, in Europe and Asia, we're gonna see positive changes. We're gonna see this massive population growth because they have new access to food. There's gonna be a general increase in wealth for many people. Um, and there's gonna be a decrease in feudalism and this rise of um, capitalism that we're gonna see impacted into period two and also into American history. In Africa, um, the Spanish and the Portuguese are gonna use these goods to trade for West African slaves. They're gonna be used for slave manual labor in the new world after a failed attempt to use the indigenous people. And in the Americas, there's gonna be a vast amount of spread of diseases like smallpox and measles that are gonna kill a large, large portion, a majority of the population in um, the new world. There are different social classes that are created um, by um, racial mixing between um, Europeans and natives and then Africans and um, Europeans as well, um, creating the mestizo, which is part indigenous American, part European. Um, we're gonna see the use of horses, as we said, making hunting easier, but we're also gonna see an attempt to enslave native people and use them for labor, but that's gonna die out because the natives are gonna severely die out because of the extreme exposure to um, European diseases in the new world. There's gonna be different examples of technology that's gonna allow for trade to happen at a greater rate. Examples of technology um, such as the sextant, um, allowing for more precise sailing, um, the caravel, those increased ships, um, the compass, the quadrant is all going to improve the efficiency of sailing. And then there are going to be better ways of forming colonies that we're going to talk about more so in our next video, such as joint stock companies that are going to be used to raise money um, for these explorations. So instead of a king or a queen or an individual merchant funding for the entirety of one of these voyages, which may or may not come back because of the different conditions, so many different variables to go wrong, that individual would lose their entire investment. 
if they split up this um, debt, if they split up this risk, it would be much um, more likely for them to yield a success. So say that I put in 10% of the profits, um, I just put in 10% of the cost for a colony to be set up, um, that I rake in 10% of the profits as well, whatever comes back. But if something goes wrong, I don't lose a full 100% investment. I only lose 10% of what it would have been the entirety of the cost. It's going to allow for the setup of different settlements like Jamestown, which eventually is successful, which is going to encourage other settlements to be sent over in a similar fashion. It's also a very early model of um, modern corporations where instead of one person specifically owning everything, that people share stocks, percentages of a company um, in order to pay for um, all of the things that that business needs, but then they would get a percentage of said profits. We're also going to see different forms of um, art in the new world that can be used to explain where we're going to get our information. So we're not just getting information from European sources. One example is the image you're going to see above here and try to figure out what's going on in this image. Hopefully you might have been able to identify the different spots on this individual, kind of like smallpox. It's an, uh, a depiction, an early native depiction of an individual affected by smallpox. And we can date when these cases are generally seen. The impact of smallpox and measles on the native population is going to be absolutely devastating. It's gonna be extremely deadly. It's gonna kill over 90% of the native population in areas because they're not immune to the European diseases. They haven't had the ability to build up their resistance to these diseases. But there are the introduction of different animals and crops in the new world that are beneficial to um, those already living there, such as the horse, for example, changing life on the Great Plains for the Sioux tribe. Different crops like wheat, rice and sugar that are going to be heavily cultivated um, when the southern colonies are set up for sure for the English history, for the American history side of this discussion. Outside of the diseases that completely ravaged through the Native American populations, the encomienda system was probably the most significant negative impact on the indigenous people of North America. Um, the Native Americans were used um, by the Spanish or attempted to be used by the Spanish for manual labor on plantations. It's a Native American slave system. And the goal um, was twofold. Number one, encourage populations to come over and settle the vast amount of territory that the Spanish have taken over. And two, use this labor um, for agriculture um, to take these raw materials, send them back. Um, to the um, old world, as well as gaining precious metals as well to increase wealth. Um, but eventually the Native American system is going to die out for two reasons. Number one, the Native Americans have a greater access to the terrain, so they're gonna be able to escape at a better rate. They're gonna have connections with other tribes perhaps, that they're gonna have more things at their disposal and a higher likelihood of if they do try to escape, they actually can escape. And number two, which is much more significant of a reason, is because of the lack of exposures to these European diseases, most of the Native Americans, um, not only because of the diseases, but the harsh treatment, are going to die out very quickly. And so the work source is going to deplete. So turning from the native slave labor, the Portuguese and especially the Spanish are going to turn towards the African slave labor system. Um, and and th this may bring up a question for many people about why did they go to Africa? Why did Africans get enslaved versus other groups? Why specifically them? And why did they not die out like the native populations did? Well, to answer that last question specifically, the native um, populations had not experienced contact with the Europeans where geographically Africa is much closer to Europe and whether there were European colonizers coming down to Africa or trading with certain kingdoms, there was already contact with Europeans. And so there was a greater rate at which Africans had built up, especially West Africans had built up a greater resistance. Also, 
West Africans are a lot closer to um, the New World, and it, uh, they were seen as completely separate species um, to the Europeans. There was definitely a racially based system of slavery. This um, idea that there is a hierarchy chain, and based on the color of your skin, if you're in the or if you're one of these indigenous people, or if you are an African, if you're a non-European, that you are in a lesser status than the European. They're going to use that to justify that unethical treatment. Um, these West African um, groups were used um, in the plantations and the mines in place of the Native Americans. And the Spanish really develop a strict caste system um, in which you cannot escape um, certain levels of the social hierarchy. You are born into it because of the color of your skin. Um, in this caste system, there were a level for Africans, for natives, for Europeans. The Europeans were at the top. Then the mixed race, um, whether they were European and native, what we would call mestizo, or European and African ancestry, we would call mulattoes, um, biracial individuals, that they were on a kind of halfway in between because they were not considered pure blood. But if you were um, below that, um, you would not be able to escape it. There's a many different misunderstandings between the Europeans and the natives. Um, gender roles, many native societies were um, maternal. Um, they were not patriarchal like um, the European societies were. So there were many differences in understanding about the roles of women and it confused the Europeans and it confused the natives about what roles um, people had based on their gender. And so there were a lot of misunderstandings in that realm. There were misunderstandings on the concept of land. Natives didn't own individual land. It was the collective um, job of the tribes to foster and be stewards of the land. You can't own the earth. The earth in many of these native cultures was a god. Um, you can't own God. It was a concept that they couldn't possibly fathom about why these Europeans would want to do so. Differences in religion. Um, uh, natives believed in gods that were based uh, in animals, animism. Um, they were polytheistic. Um, there were shamans in their culture, and the Europeans looked at them as heathens. They looked at them um, as completely crazy. They didn't know what they were talking about and that it was their job to colonize and convert these individuals. There were some aspects um, of each other's cultures that were eventually adopted, but there were many misunderstandings, and that is basically the sum of what their relationships were. Uh, natives did adopt some European technology, and that's an example of this transfusion, but that was much, much less common from the whole. There was many different examples of labor in the New World, um, and the natives did resist it. They didn't just accept this. Um, they tried to preserve um, their political, economic, and religious autonomy, um, their own independence, and so there were fights breaking out between the Europeans and the natives for conquests of land. There were also many different debates um, over how non-Europeans should be treated, whether those are Africans or natives. Some Europeans, um, such as Juan de Sepulveda, um, saw these non-Europeans as savages, and advocated for the harsh treatment of natives and that this was justified under the ideas of Christianity that we are going to see um, later used in the antebellum period before the Civil War to justify um, the Southern slavery system for some individuals. But then there were others, um, and a great example in America, or of American history and rather world history of people that were much more ahead of their time, Bartolome de las Casas argued that natives deserve the same treatment as all other men's. This is extremely progressive way, way ahead of his time. Um, and it really does play a huge role in ending the encomienda system. However, the problem is, is this moves from the enslavement and subjugation of natives to the subjugation of Africans as slaves in this so-called black legend. There were many different arguments that were used throughout period one, two, three, four, all throughout American history used for justification of 
this unethical treatment of um, any non-European or non-white um, uh, Africans or natives, for example, um, that are subjected to this treatment. Um, ideas based on racial superiority, religious superiority, um, the desire to spread Christianity, yeah, that this is justification, that it's God's work, um, and that these people, these entire groups of people lumped together, seen as barbaric, um, and that is going to be used as a lot of the justification for this unethical treatment. This is the end of our very first video, um, and we will continue to go down this journey, but remember, this is just day one. There's a lot of time to learn. There's a lot of time to grow. There's a lot of time to ask questions, so do not get discouraged early. Take this as part of the whole trust the process. If you have any questions about any content or clarification, drop a comment down in um, the comment section below, and I will be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. Peace.